we were set back by unscrupulous black contractors mm. who robbed us, uh, let us down, took our money, didn't do the work, robbed the school, stole from the school, fixed one thing while they destroyed something else. So then finally, I decided I'm going to go ahead and give white folks a try. So I called an HVAC company that I had met with when we first purchased the school. He came in and he got the two HVAC units that we purchased a year ago sitting in storage for a whole year. He had them on the school within 48 hours. I had waited four years for black people. The white man did it in two days. Mm -hmm. HVAC is in. Mm -hmm. We got air, we got heat, but they got to put some final things on it so we can pass inspection. Mm -hmm. Once they do that, all we have to do is paint and uh, clean and buff the floors and we ready for the grand opening. Wow. So we at the final stage. I am so... Introduce the second gentleman that sits in the room. Um, his name is Mr. Omar. And hold on because I'm so used to saying another name. I have to, I have to remember. It's not Mr. Dr. Omar Johnson anymore. anymore. No. It's Dr. Omar Ifatunde. Correct, Mama. Ah. Now... He comes with a whole lot of alphabets after his name as well. Not the ones that you hear highlighted in the news a lot lately, but the ones that are PhDs. He's a doctor and psychiatrist. And I'm going to let you give a little bit more detail on the CSPs and the M and the E's and the D's, you know, and, and let, let people get a little bit more information about what clout you're carrying. Yes. Mm -hmm. First, I want to say good morning to the U.S. Virgin Islands family, the brothers and sisters of St. John. St. Croix, St. Thomas. It's an honor to be back on the island after 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, last, yesterday was phenomenal. It was beautiful, great conversation, great camaraderie, great fellowship and networking. Uh, it's my sincere hope that the brothers and sisters will not just go back home with the information and the motivation, but transform it and roll it over into action and works. We as a people have always been profound with our philosophy and profound with our ideology, but we have not been profound with our creations. Uh, we need institutions and we need solutions. And so I'm hoping that, you know, my message here yesterday, my being here yesterday has served as a catalyst for brothers and sisters to rally around Brother Smokey and all other good works that are going on in the island. When I look at the Virgin Islands, four things come to mind. Number one, psychologically speaking, it is the apathy and inertia of the people. We are too comfortable being on the bottom. We are too comfortable being exploited. We are too comfortable being oppressed. And we are too comfortable having non-African people dictate our fate. So that's the psychological observation. The economic observation is that non-African people are using this island as a haven for their wealth. They're using this island as an opportunity to accumulate wealth. You know, as I go around the island, I see the Arabs and the various corporations and businesses that they run, the Europeans, obviously, and their domination of the formal financial structure. And then you see the East Indians who are able to build their economic fortunes off of the black U.S. Virgin Island people. But I'm not seeing that same type of economic fortune being cast on our people. So we need an economic revolution. We need an economic transformation and we need an economic black print. After the economics, I look at the agriculture which is a problem throughout the Caribbean and I would dare say throughout the African world, coming all the way from St. John's all the way over to the mother continent, our food is coming to us by non-African people. And not only is that food coming to us from non-African people, it's coming from groups that are actually hostile to the best interests of African people. So we need an agricultural program, an agricultural platform, an agricultural agenda. No people can dare claim to be free if their food is coming from another group. And lastly, I would say the final issue is corruption. Uh, and of course, this is a touchy topic, but it's one that has to be articulated. I think that there are members of the government and I have not thoroughly studied them individually, so I wanna be respectful to them all, but there's no way that Europeans could be having their way on this island. There's no way that your youth unemployment rate is as high as it is. There's no way that your incarceration rate is as high as it is. And then you look at the cost for goods and services that have mushroomed since COVID. And you have to wonder, is the government complicit with the European, with the Asian, with the Arab financial sector? Are they complicit in the exploitation of black people here in the Virgin Islands? Because I'm not seeing much done 
towards uh, price control. I'm not seeing much done to give black people economic opportunities to build small and large scale businesses that can compete with those owned by the Asians as well as the Arabs and the Europeans. So what exactly is the government doing to stop this entire island from being confiscated by non-African people? Hmm. That's exactly the That's question exactly many of us have. I have a question for Mr. Omar, if I may. Um, why did you change your name? Actually, my name was given to me, I want to say, 12 years ago. My first visit to, to the Oyotunji African Village in Sheldon, South Carolina, which is about 15 minutes from Buford. I was invited there by a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps to offer a community lecture. And unbeknownst to me at the time, he said, we're going to stop by an African village that I had never heard of, mm. which is the Oyotunji African Village. And if anyone wants to learn more about Oyotunji, they can go to oyotunji.org. That's oyotunji.org. It is the only authentic and traditional African village in the continental United States recognized to be such by Ile Ife in Nigeria. And so when I got to the village, the chief there, Chief Olaitan, rest in paradise, he joined the ancestors a few years ago, but I asked them for a spiritual divination, which is what we call a dafa in Yoruba culture. And so he gave me the dafa, and then he said, you have to get an African name, which he did not choose. So in communication with the oracle, Orunmila, who's the divinity of destiny in European culture, uh, the name Ifatunde came. And so then he said, you need a last name. And so once again, in consultation with the oracle, Oguntade came. So Ifatunde Oguntade is the full name. Ifatunde means destiny has returned. And Oguntade means Ogun wears the crown. And Ogun is the, 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 the divinity of power and war. And so I've had the name for 12 years. And I've asked people to use it for 12 years. Mm -hmm. But only this year did I have a New Year's resolution of being more strenuous and assertive and having brothers and sisters respect the name. And so that's why now I've been making it a point that brothers and sisters refer to me as Dr. Umar Ifatunde. I'm gonna jump right into something that uh, many may have seen you on Facebook or, or YouTube and wherever else, social media in a whole, um, discussing your school. Mm -hmm. And if you could share a little bit more about your school and the purpose for the school and, mm -hmm. you know, where things are at so that people will know it won't just hype talk. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> a, a brief history on the school. During the spring of 2014, an associate of mine gave me a phone call, and he told me that the HBCU St. Paul's College in Lawrenceville, Virginia, had come up for auction. He said that they were selling it at a very cheap price, and you may want to look into it. Prior to that phone call, I had been hosting a quarterly meeting of the minds in the seven cities, Tidewater area of Virginia. And we were talking about building a school. And there were individuals in Virginia who were helping me case the state and the area for a school. So then finally, St. Paul's College comes up for sale. Now, this is a college that was built by one of our great ancestors coming right out of slavery, who was a close friend of Booker T. Washington. Mm. It was actually modeled on the Tuskegee, uh, the Tuskegee system. Uh, Dr. Uh, George Washington Carver actually visited the school. And so when I contacted the mortgage company out of Richmond, I was trying to remember their name, and I, Motley's, Motley's Auction. They told me that they wanted $2 million. I said I did not have it. I just heard about it. They said, if you can get 500000 we could potentially hold it for you. Give us $500,000, we will put you on the payment plan for the next one point five. So I started raising money. I took my first donation in St. Louis, Missouri, the first time I've ever asked the public for money. Mm -hmm. And I've always been uncomfortable with asking for money because I believe that I've seen so many people exploit the love of our people to get rich. Mm -hmm. So I was very uncomfortable asking for that donation in St. Louis. I still remember this very moment, but I had to get comfortable I was going to make this happen. So we tried to raise as much money as we can. Brothers and sisters donated, but we were not successful. That HBCU was sold to the Chinese, who mm -hmm. still own it to this day. So after losing the bid for St. Paul's, we said we're just going to find a regular day school and start education. And so I traveled all over the country. I thought we would end up in Detroit because Detroit has a lot of Catholic schools in great condition. But I was told that the archdiocese was not going to sell me anything. Mm -hmm. Then we found a school that we were going to rent in money earning Mount Vernon, New York. And then the white man in charge of that told me he had to get in contact with the Vatican in Rome 
And he was told by the Vatican in Rome that they could not rent me to school. And so city after city, school after school, the door was being slammed in our face, even though we had the money. We should have had the school five years sooner, but you can only do what people allow you to do. White people had made it clear they were not interested in helping me realize my educational vision for our children. So finally, in 2017, I come back from my annual group tour to Africa, Benin, Togo, and Ghana. And then I'm on my way to the Nat Turner celebration, which we celebrate every August the 21st, which is the anniversary of the Turner War. Also happens to be my solar return. And so I'm on LoopNet, and this school pops up in Wilmington, Delaware. I said, this school looks pretty good. So I drive past it on my way down to Nat Turner land, August the 20th of 2017. I get in contact with the owners. I say, I want to look at this school. I look at the school when I come back from Nat Turner land, beautiful school. And then I find out that they want $2 million, four buildings, two schools, two million. We did not have that. So I stayed at it. I negotiated with them. I begged, I pleaded, I prayed. I did everything that I could from August of 2017 until February of 2019. And that's when they finally said, give us what we have. Give us what you have. We'll give you the schools. So we finally purchased the schools on February the 7th of 2019, which happens to be the bicentennial year of Frederick Douglass' birth. And it happens to be the centennial year of Marcus Garvey's incorporation of the Black Star Line steamships, which were incorporated in Delaware. So I took that as a very positive sign that we were meant to be here. From 2019 until September the 10th of 2022, we were set back by unscrupulous black contractors mm. who robbed us, uh, let us down, took our money, didn't do the work, robbed the school, stole from the school, fixed one thing while they destroyed something else. We just suffered at the hands of our own people who were interested in money, not interested in us getting the school done. So then finally, I decided I'm going to go ahead and give white folks a try. So I called an HVAC company that I had met with when we first purchased the school. He came in. And he got the two HVAC units that we purchased a year ago sitting in storage for a whole year. He had them on the school within 48 hours. I had waited four years for black people. The white man did it in two days. Mm -hmm. And so then he helped me find an electrician. He helped me find a plumber. So our plumbing is done. Electric got done. Sprinklers got done. All of this is coming from one white man. Mm -hmm. He did more than all the black contractors I ran into. Mm -hmm. And so that hurts. It's painful. But at the same time, it reinforces the reason why we need the school in the first place, right. because black men are clearly not on our job. And so right now, as I sit here with you, Empress, all of the required repairs have been done. Uh, the sprinkler system repaired and inspected. Plumbing repaired and inspected, electric repaired and inspected, burglar alarms repaired and inspected. The only thing left now is to put the final touches on the HVAC. HVAC is in. Mm -hmm. We got air, we got heat, but they got to put some final things on it so we can pass inspection. Mm -hmm. Once they do that, all we have to do is paint and uh, clean and buff the floors and we're ready for the grand opening. Wow. So we're at the final stage. I am so, you, you, you have no idea how impressed I am, not just in what you've accomplished, but the magnitude. You know, the magnitude and what you've been able to do mm -hmm. and, and the people that you're rallying together with that as well. Mm -hmm. But it's a book that you wrote. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit more about that book, I can read from this card, but it'll probably be a little yes, easier if you just tell it. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, my first book, Psychoacademic Holocaust, The Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys, I released that book in March of 2013, right after I earned my doctorate in 2012. So that book was... Uh, therapeutic because it was uh, something that I decided to reward myself with after going through eight grueling years of racism towards earning my doctorate in clinical psychology. But after I wrote the first book, I saw that there were still some questions parents had. Mm -hmm. So I said, you're going to have to break this down a lot more so parents can really digest it. So the first book was more of a tour de force of how the miseducation machine operates. The second book Black Parent Advocate, The Art of War for Dealing with America's Public and Charter Schools is more of an intervention manual. So parents can go into that book and find their specific concern, their specific problem as it relates to IEP, autism, learning disability, speech and language, pledging a flag, discipline, classroom racism, report card grades, standardized testing, evaluations, uh, you name it. And they can go straight to the section that's most relevant for them. I provide them with a letter. All they have to do is reproduce it, mm -hmm. send it into the school. Mm -hmm. So let's say the school wants to evaluate your child for a reading disability. You don't believe your child has that reading disability. Go to that chapter in the book, read the background on the issue, because we need to be 
aware okay. and then reproduce my letter, send it into the school. Uh, let's say your child is in special ed. They need special ed, but they're not getting a quality service. Go to that chapter in a book that deals with children who need it, but are not getting what they need. Mm -hmm. Reproduce that letter, send it into the school. So this book is as easy as it can get because you don't have to formulate your own letter. I give you the letter. Mm -hmm. Find the problem, find the letter, change the name, send it in. So I'm very proud of this book because I think it's going to be even more helpful than the first one. Well, I, I think so too. And I was, the reason I ain't getting on is can I jump up and not lying quickly? No. I should have brought more copies they were though. Gone. Yes. You know, before you could say, here they are, there mm -hmm. was a line already yes, there. Yes. And, and I really um, want to say a big applaud to those who took the time to spend their money that yes, way yes. to utilize those tools within our community. Absolutely. It's, it's important that we are able to to sound our voice for those especially that can't sound their own. Absolutely. Um, and, and being our youth and elderly, you know, that's exactly yes, where yes. we start. And at some point, I want to come back and uh, do a training for St. Thomas and St. Croix. I have a Black Parent Know Your School Rights boot camp. It's from 8 to 8. It's 12 hours. We can cut it if we need to, but you really need the 12 hours mm -hmm. where we go through everything you need to effectively advocate for that child. We go through the disabilities, the IEP process, the evaluation process, the 504, the educational amendments. We go through autism, the learning disability, the intellectual disability, the emotional disturbance. I literally give you everything I can give you mm -hmm. in 12 hours. And if you master that information, it comes with a packet of information. And if you master that, you'll be able to go into the school and protect your child from almost anything. Good. And I am sure there are many who are interested in learning more about what you have to say in that. And perhaps that training is something that can happen sooner than later. Yes, bigger. yes. Um, as those arrangements are made through whichever for, uh, platform you are able to do so, we would like to be able to promote that and yes. advertise that and let yes. the people know what's going on. Um, it, it, there were many who did not know of you being here yesterday. Okay. Uh, might be because you didn't come on my show first. Uh, <laughs> why didn't I come on her show first, exactly. Baba Smoke? <laughs> but uh, she could tell you I was here. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he did. He he did okay, come through. Okay. But um, there are some channels that we have to go through. Understood. And understood. There wasn't enough time to do so. Understood. So understood. Do know that he did make an. He came to that very door. So all right. I, all right. I'm not, I'm not all right. Lie at all right. All right. All right. Um, okay. The oh, Paula, please call back. That was an accident. I do have the phones ringing off the hook here. Um, I have another caller I just put on hold. I didn't know if you were interested in answering. Any sure, questions. sure. Why not? Why not? All right. And let me also give your audience uh, my cell number in case they want to reach out to me by text message. Don't call me, I don't answer the phone, text message or WhatsApp. And that number is 215 989 9858. Again, that is 215. 989-9858. That's not on your bookmark. Uh -huh. You have the 800 number on okay. the bookmark where you can leave a voicemail, okay, well, but you I'm can't text that. it. I'm show them that yeah. Anyway. So the, the 800 number, 8444 Dr. Umar, 8444 D R U M A R. You can leave a voicemail on that number. I check all the messages personally, but if you want to text message me, it's 215 989 9858. 215-989-9858. And I'm going to just uh, put this up on my Facebook yes. as well yes. so that others can see those who can't uh, write as fast as you speak. Like yes. <laughs> ah. All right, cool. Uh, let's go to the first caller. Good morning, caller. Welcome. I'll turn it up a little bit. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You missed out, brother. You missed out. But don't worry. St. Croix going to get their shit. <laughs> he just said out of Great point. Great point. And to your point, I would say that there are two global agendas for African people. The one is to make us landless. The first agenda is to make us landless. And the second agenda is to make us lifeless. There is a very serious agenda to make black people propertyless, to eliminate us as landowners anywhere on the earth. And this is why here in the Virgin Islands, you have to get organized on a grassroots level to stop the illegal confiscation of black owned lands by parasitic European corporations and individuals who come down from America and cherry pick properties, particularly those that are going through the probate process. 
We have a lot of black people here in the Virgin Islands who cannot afford decent, adequate legal representation as they fight to hold on to the property that's been in their families for decades. And these white folks are coming with money and many of them fearful that they will lose the property in court are simply selling it out of fear for a couple pennies to white folks who will turn around and make millions off of it. But that's happening all over the world. In Barbados, I see it. In Guadeloupe, I saw it. In Jamaica, I saw it. Even in Africa, we're seeing how the Chinese and the East Indians and the Arabs are coming in and buying large plots of land. Land is not a renewable resource. Once it is gone, it is gone, and we do not get it back. We have to learn how to stop selling our land, and we have to learn how to responsibly make sure that taxes are taken care of so we don't get put in a position where we have to lose the land. That's one. And number two, there's a global African depopulation agenda. The LGBTQ is a part of this. COVID is a part of this. Poor health care and nutrition is a part of this. Crime, poverty, and homelessness is a part of this. They want to wipe African people off the face of the earth. And of course, that's not something that can be done overnight. And I'm not sure if it can be done at all, but I definitely think they can make a serious dent in the population of African people if we keep on swallowing these vaccinations and swallowing this propaganda that's coming to us from the Western powers. Thank you. Good morning, Paula. Welcome. Good morning. Yeah. Bless. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I can answer that question and I just... <laughs> Yes, yes, and I want you to give it to him, tick, 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 but it's okay. Huh? Yes? Let me tell you something, Mr. Thomas. This isn't, one organization is not, one event is not is not going to define based on that, what he said, my relationship to 1,000. You understand? Know exactly what he is saying. 